just to sort of give you a little bit of background, this is a five steps to dig, well, five digital steps, sorry, to enhancing employability. And essentially, this has come from my previous job. So I worked in um, a further education college in South Wales, and I only started at the university last August. So I've actually been with the institution for less than a year. And in that time, quite a lot of things have sort of occurred to me and I'm, I've, I've just been promoted to the course leader for childhood and youth studies in the education department. So I've got a little bit of an overview about things that we can start changing um, or things that we can start doing that don't necessarily mean massive changes, but can really enhance the student experience. So what we're going to be doing <coughs> is having a little bit of a focus on employability for our students by using ePortfolios. Now, we're not definitely not the first um, sort of department or anything to do ePortfolios. I know a lot of people are doing them in different ways, but we've come from a very people first, a very student first, where we've looked and we've problematized what a lot of our students are saying about leaving in year three and not necessarily remembering what they've done for three years and what they can put in their job applications. And problematizing maybe things like um, looking for student volunteers and not really having any form of intrinsic motivation for them to do certain things. So this is why this has come about. So to give it a little bit of context, um, like I said already, I'm the course leader for the BA in Childhood New Studies in the Education Sociology Department. Um, and that also includes the um, Childhood New Studies with Criminology strand as well. So I've got quite a lot of diverse professional experiences that happen as part of work placements. And because of my background, which is outdoor adventure and further education, there's a lot of unique experiences that students are having that I can't necessarily professionally relate to, especially in terms of criminology, because it's not really my background. Um, however, with this sort of routine that we've come up with where students create e-portfolios and then they build those e-portfolios using um, sort of a facilitated structure that we've come up with, we've sort of got a bit of a a one size fits all, but with some real um, potential for them to completely personalize their experience, which in my in my current sort of uh, research interest, which is digital pedagogies and use of digital technology and learning, the personalization of digital experiences is absolutely paramount and ownership is even more important. So that's something that's governed this in a big way. Um, so welcome to my workshop five digital steps to enhancing employability um, and it's the essentially the ongoing contribution by learners to digital e-portfolios for employability but to create a tangible record for seeking employment on completion of their degree um, i've had a couple of year threes come up to me just sort of sort of in january time when they're looking at applying for jobs or graduate schemes or um, especially we have a lot of students that go to to get into youth work and they sit down with a job description or a job application and they say there's so many things that we've done in our degree and so many theoretical underpinnings for practical experience and i've got to the end of year three and i don't really know where to start so this is almost like a way of having a lifelong learning or an e-portfolio or or some almost like a record of achievement that students contribute to throughout all three years of their degree so when they, they get to the end they have this tangible thing that they can take with them um, <clears throat> so these are the sort of the learning outcomes we're going to discuss the idea of a competency-based e-portfolio for undergraduate students you can probably tell that i work in education with this incredibly structured learning outcomes communication um, identify the importance of a school-wide approach uh, which is which is <clears throat> something that we found is really important, especially when we are asking students to go beyond their learning programmes. Um, and then we're going to look at the next steps of the digital e-portfolios. I don't know if anybody is familiar with the BET, the BET conference in the Excel Centre in London. I went to a couple of really good workshops last year, sorry, this year in January. It feels like last year, but it was definitely this year, um, where the communication development of e-portfolios um, there were some really good ideas about how this can be put into a little bit more of a digital economy and how we can start showing employers that our students have got digital skills without actually having to say it. So that's probably why um, sharing with employers and enhancing applications is so important in this process. So 
this is the way we problematized it. I think especially from my perspective, coming from um, the outside in where I was doing this with my PGC students in the college in Wales, is how can students reflectively measure achievement, um, employability skills and experiences throughout their degree without having to sort of go above and beyond? OK, I think what's happening is we need to take those opportunistic moments where students are having almost a bit of a light bulb moment or they're having a really strong reflective discussion, capturing it and then giving it a little bit of an employability spin where we can say, right, if you're in a job interview, that piece of learning that you've just done is going to be incredi incredibly valuable. Um, so it's really introducing that lifelong learning element. And largely, I think the main thing is that we're not getting students to simply tick a box get their assessments done, get their grades and just have a grade profile. Because qualifications are something that we absolutely need to work towards. However, competency based CVs and competency based skills are also such a huge part of employability, whereas students don't necessarily understand how to capture that if they don't have a formal qualification. So that's one of the way we problematized it. Um, and what makes what motivates students beyond their assessments? I know that we have a lot of initiatives in our um, department where we want students to get involved and represent the school and we want students to get involved and be student mentors or to be part of our consolidation week activities. But they won't do those things because they are very tight for time. We completely understand our students come from a variety of different backgrounds, but also because they don't necessarily see the value in investing that time because there isn't necessarily anything that they can evidence from it. Um, aside, I think um, some department made up certificates, which I think the students ended up finding quite funny, which isn't really necessarily what we wanted. So that's the first uh, one of the, the second question, sorry. And then, oh, bear with me. And then what incentives can be intrinsically attractive to students to get involved? I'm sure I, I, I can't necessarily see your faces because I'm presenting, but there is um, a real difficulty, I think, in identifying what motivates students to do more than their assessments. And it doesn't necessarily matter how many times I ask students, I'll always get completely different answers. But what I have found is that those, those things have to be intrinsically motivated. We can pay students to be our ambassadors through the marketing department, or we can say things like, you know, this will be really good on your CV. But unless they can really show, we can really show them that there is a lifelong learning element and that we're all investing in it. It's not really something that we can motivate them with. So that's hopefully what we'll be doing with these e-portfolios. E so this is going to be in five steps. Just keep an eye on time, 10 minutes. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk you through the five steps because they definitely, from my perspective as the course leader, where I'm... Um, sort of getting all staff to sing off the same hymn sheet with it. But the, the step one is the easiest step, and it's the development of the portfolios. So currently in our context, which is definitely what I'm bound by when I'm sharing this with you, is at level five, so in year two, the childhood news studies and the early childhood studies students have to go off and do either a 60 hour or a 90 hour placement. And that all culminates in um, a portfolio that is a Word document that gets submitted to Moodle, turn it in, and then they never have to look at it again because it's part of their assessment. So this year, what we're going to be doing is collating all of that information for their reflective e um, portfolios into an e-portfolio using the medium of Google Sites. Now, for University of Portsmouth staff and, and probably Chichester as well, as a Google institution, all students have a Google account and all of them ha therefore have access to Google Sites so they can put this together. And it is an incredibly intuitive platform. Um, I'll show you an example. Please, it's an incredibly, it's an incredibly juvenile example. It took me about 10 minutes to put together. But this is just what an, an e-portfolio could look like. So the student's name may be the profile of that student. Um, a CV, a personal statement that sits quite nicely in there with their Google Docs. I've laid this e-portfolio out to meet the needs of our specific students, but for transferability across the organisation, this could look any way at all. I think in sciences, it could have maybe, um, you know, the, 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 the reports from their lab uh, stuff that they've been doing, or it could have um, hypotheses and links and different things like that. But what's really important about this 
is that students can completely personalise it. And so long as they're only sharing it internally or just with an employer, they can put pretty much whatever they want on here in terms of copyright. We don't have any real issues. And I definitely checked with that. We're not, so long as we're not publishing this in the public domain, which is not what students need to do anyway with the details of their CV, they can make it look really, really good, which is great. Um, and there are so much, there's so many different ways that they can lay these out. They can put photographs, they can embed links and things like that. So it can be, it can be something that they can be proud of and they, they can build. Um, and like I said, it can be laid out to suit any course, but it is a, a record of achievement. So it's not simply an attainment of qualifications. There are so many good uh, Google site tutorials on YouTube, but also I've made a few. So if this was something that you were thinking about, just send me an email and I can send you a couple of the tutorials that I've put together, um, which is essentially a screencast of how to use the software and how we want students to engage with it. Okay, step two. So step one is the creation of the portfolio and making sure that the students know how to do it. Um, step two, and this is certainly something that isn't easy because of workload times and pressures and, and things like that, but it's get the whole team involved. So for us, the whole teaching team are aware that students are consistently across three years of the course building up an e-portfolio. It gets submitted for assessment in year two, but then it carries on. They can use it whenever because it is a Google site. So if the entire teaching team are motivated to enhance student experience for e-portfolios, it becomes an intrinsic incentive for students. Now, our current associate head of students has invested a lot of time and done some excellent work on a mentoring scheme where students come in in year one and they're mentored by year two students and it's mitigated a lot of anxiety and worry and um, settling in for our year one students. However, getting those year two volunteers was really, really difficult. And I'm sure it's happening university wide because of pressures with assessments and uh, pressures with time and childcare and all of these different things. However, when we started exposing what the portfolio could do and how it could work, all of a sudden the student said, no, I, I almost want to make it look better than everybody else's. So I want to put mentoring on mine. I want to have pictures of me doing things with my mentoring. I want to have skills because of the mentoring that I've been doing. And it becomes almost like a little bit of an evidence bank where students take ownership of it to the point where they start banking experiences. And it's not quite as simple for staff to just say, this will look great in your e-portfolio. Instead, it's worth saying things like, right, when you are looking for jobs in, 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 in the end of year three, what is it that you can really say that you did over these three years? So it helps them with their application. It helps them reflect on their own learning. But ultimately, it gives them a thread that runs all the way through because we currently don't have anything, a thread that runs all the way through that they can just constantly chip away at. Um, but like I said, so step two is definitely getting the whole team involved. That's really important. OK, step three, this is definitely the most exciting bit for me, is make the most of the digital in the portfolio. Having a, a Google site is fantastic. But it has so much potential to look very, and I get in trouble for saying this, but look very sexy. So look very attractive to employers. Um, and that sort of can be done in a variety of different ways. Simply writing on it doesn't make it any different than a Word document. However, embedding things like videos, uh, screencasts, online posters, links to social media feeds, um, Twitter, links to further evidence of professionalism like LinkedIn, blogs, promotional material that they've um, picked up from the places that they've worked in, it can all of a sudden look incredibly professional when students know how to do a lot of these things anyway. And I build it into my cinema, uh, my seminar sorry, to show them how to do screencasts where they are spending a bit of time making a video showing an academic poster that they've done and explaining it. Um, or putting a photograph with an explanation of their posters, their academic posters of their dissertation proposals. And that all sits within one place, one link, that if an employer saw, they could see an absolute spectrum of things that our students have done on their degrees. Um, I've put just the same example again. I can share this example with you. So again, again it's very sort of um, juvenile, but this is what it could look like. I've just thrown on, and this took five minutes, 
our students have areas of focus when they write reflective journals so the as part of their critical incident and one student particularly um her area was focus was about uh, ability grouping in a primary school so what i did is i used that as an example and i've just embedded a bbc news article in an e-portfolio about should young children be grouped by ability and almost like a ted talk or a, a youtube video about that same topic to build up a portfolio of evidence of this is what i have been looking at and almost in simple terms and then this is my reflection my academically written reflection about that specific area of focus so making the most of digital in these e-portfolios can it will look like a professional website we can have videos of students talking we can have pictures photos blogs linkedin links to their professional twitter accounts we've got students with professional instagram accounts as well where they've linked to their professional workplace and they're allowed to share things about maybe what the the students have been doing or the youth group have been doing so it has real potential in this digital form to take loads of different forms and formats and and look really good so that's definitely a big step in this is make the most of the digital um and going back to that really strong underpinning piece of evidence is that ownership of the portfolios is such an important element for continued work on it if students and I've, I've seen it happen in front of my eyes in class students have started to develop their e-portfolios they've embedded a couple of videos and they almost get a little bit addicted to it like well that will look better if i go and do a couple of weeks of mentoring that will look better if i find a blog that i really do appreciate in terms of educational professionalism and I and I, I embed that in and write a reflection about it it becomes quite something for students to be incredibly proud of um, step three then is facilitate continued employability enhancement through personal tutors now again from a course leader perspective this is something that is it is pressure is the student survey which is I've received advice and guidance on job opportunities and careers or I'm aware of opportunities for work experience. So what we did for this is we embedded in the professional portfolio a futures section where instead of getting students to write skills audits and maybe find things that they might specifically want in the future, we got students to start reflecting on the processes that they've been to to enhance their employability. Now, I know we've got someone in this webinar who works in employability and we've got um, an employability team and they're always saying to me I want to see your students more you know we, we advertise our services and we come into lectures but we don't really see those students so I've incentivized that by putting a section in the e-portfolio that allows students to reflect on what they're doing to enhance their employability prospects so it could be going to a careers fair and summarizing it into five points that they feel like they've learned from that careers fair or um, embedding in their e-portfolio maybe courses or further employment enhancers a good example for us is pediatric first aid um, what i often like to do is say to my students right if there was a child in this room right now and that child was choking how many of you could do something about that and it ends up um, sort of students sort of thinking, oh, I'd, I'd quite like to be that person who could do something about that. So we then advertise sort of courses. There are some really good online safeguarding courses that our lecturers in the department can facilitate through external sources. And we give them all of these things that they can reflect about in their futures and start building up these bolt on qualifications at the same time as doing their degree. Um, the other good thing about the futures section is that I would absolutely hate the fact that well i do hate the fact that students don't see job adverts or they don't see job specifications that they want to go for until the end of year three because it's all of a sudden there's this big surprise i didn't realize that i needed to have done this i didn't realize that maybe i needed to have this qualification or be aware of that so having this futures section and constantly keeping their hand in with, with these are potential jobs I might like, and this is the sort of skill that I need to do them is quite important. I, I always say we don't want any surprises with employability. Um, and I know that some of our students come onto the degree because they genuinely want to enhance their understanding of working with children and young people. But for a large amount of our students, they are coming to enhance their career prospects. So that's that's really important for step four. And then finally, and this is definitely been um, 
influenced by the bet 2020 in January up in the London Excel is that putting our graduates into a digital economy is all well and good when we're saying yes I can do this I can do that but what, what graduates aren't doing is showing employers that they have these skills now the e-portfolio will exist as one link so it can be embedded in a personal statement it can be embedded on a cv so if cvs are being emailed for jobs and the e-portfolio is there as a link it's a really nice way for employers to choose the level of engagement that they have with that e-portfolio because some of them are going to be really big really rich pieces of information that what we could do is just simply share the link and say this is my e-portfolio if it's something that you want to look at for further information about me um the other thing that is really quite really quite fantastic is that um one college i think it was in the north of england is encouraging their students to turn their e-portfolio links into qr codes i've put one on the um on the slide turn it into qr codes and put it onto a business card so that business card has the student's name has the student's email address and contact telephone number and on the back you can actually use your phone, a smartphone, to scan the back of that business card and it brings up their e-portfolio in a mobile desktop format, which for me, I think that shows just an unbelievable amount of digital skill, digital understanding to be able to communicate your whole CV, your whole professional experience just by using a business card and a QR code, which for me was really, really cool because Yes, you could put the link to your e-portfolio on your business card, but then people then need to type that out. Whereas that quick scan can show that students really have got that edge, which I love because um, in speaking to a couple of employers, I know one from the Active Communities Network that employs a lot of our students, I told him about this idea and he said, I've never had an applicant who came to me with a link to an e-portfolio that would be that well reflected upon um, and that well populated but also to have a qr code link would really impress me those were his words so that's quite an interesting um, way so step five is definitely how we get students to share those e-portfolios um but once the link exists any edits will be automatically updated so there's no need for reprints like with a word document if you print it out and hand it out as soon as that needs updating it needs retracting reprinting and sending whereas the students will just be able to edit edit and it will change it live in that um in that link now the only thing that we need to think about is when students uh google accounts go dormant they'll still be able to access that link when they leave but they won't be able to edit it so that's something that we need to think about for the future other institutions have made it so that they can just take the google site with them and put it into a different format so that's something that we need to work on with this but so long as they are a, um, a student at the university they can build share and if they get to the end of year three and they can finish it they can still take it with them and take the information from it it's just those last edits that's the only tricky thing um so that's it then so this is what we've done today i think the most important thing to take from this is the transferability of practice i know that my context is incredibly specific in that we have work placements built into the course because it's so vocational and that we have um, a lot of reflective work because our student success is built upon building relationships and uh, working with children and young people so it is very specific um, but really think about that that transferability of practice and the way that the portfolio could be laid out to best represent your students I think is quite important um, Oh, that's it so that's me done sorry if i have spoken at a rate of absolute knots it's just something i'm really passionate about so um i, I might get a little bit quick sometimes so thank you very much if i stop sharing my screen and come back to this I think. thank you very much uh that was really interesting uh significant degree of transferability um I must admit, I did something similar at, when I was at Chai in the business school at level six. And we actually used to get the, the students had to build for a, for a level six module. They had to apply for a job. Uh, they went on placement as part of that. But then we asked them to develop an artifact. And the artifact will show how your degree has evolved over three years. And we, we weren't Google, so they did it in Go they did it in Wix. Oh, yeah, Wix, the blogging site. Yes, yeah, but yeah. exactly the same. And then and they then they started kind of like videoing themselves. 
put the videos on YouTube and then we're embedding the videos into the Wix as well to offer that reflection around the artifact. So it's, it's, it's a really great tool. And I think, yeah, I, you, we're using Google Sites is so intuitive to use. I think it's great. It's a lovely example of practice that other colleagues could use. Um, colleagues, we have time. Would anybody like to ask Jody any questions? Please unmute and just drop in if you'd like. Julie, ask, um, how do you assess it? Okay, for it's for for the actual assessment of it, it's the critical incident that they write. So it's um it's a fifteen hundred word as part of their placement. It's a fifteen hundred word reflective piece, and that that's what gets rigorously assessed, and it has to come in through turn it in as well as be embedded in their e-portfolio. Um, and they do get a lot of formative feedback surrounding the whole portfolio as well, but that is the only real summative bit. I think um, assessing it in terms of their images look better than your images is not something we're ever going to do, you know, because we really need to give ownership to them. So the reflective writing is what we actually summatively assess, because then it's obviously linked to their academic and undergraduate competencies. But in terms of receiving it as an assessment, they they just get a lot of feedback saying this is brilliant. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Really? Okay. That's really good. We do a similar um, like idea in terms of the coursework in the second year as well. So this would be great. And I looked at the portfolio that the university had. I'd love to see it as well. If you if you do have any examples that are really good, I'd love to see. Um, I mean, obviously taking names out and getting permission. I really would love to see them and see how people run with them. It would be brilliant. Pat, you all right, Pat? Yeah, I can't really see everyone. Yeah. Well, it's very informative. Thank you. Actually, in the previous institution where I worked, we have a program, it's a food science and the engineering program, and the students used to prepare the portfolio. It's called a Mahara. They use Mahara platform, and uh, obviously they need to create, um, you know, the uh, ice cream or new food, and uh, they include all the information in their portfolio, and most of the students, they got job. So they, during the interview time, mostly they all, they were employed in food industry. So in industries, they presented their case it's very nicely. They most of them they now they're all almost like hundred percent employment, and that enhanced to the yeah, clearly this e-portfolio is the best way forward for employability. Thank you. And I think I think as well to add to that is that when I came into the university, there wasn't anything happening. We we were taking a lot of employability boxes, but we weren't having that real lifelong. This is something that you want to continue to build upon. Um, but what really, what I really want to hammer home from our perspective is that the sharing of the portfolios through a QR code or through a link or through a really inventive way is actually quite, is actually quite powerful because what some, what some students were thinking of doing as well is a really quick um, YouTube, Andy, like you mentioned, a really quick YouTube clip of hi my name is Jodie Pennell this is me this is my background if you click the link in the description that's my e-portfolio and sharing the link to the video with the with you know and having these really personalized almost in your face I'm digitally literate please employ me sort of think that which is what which is what we're looking for yeah definitely and thank you thank you no thank you thanks Pat anybody got any other questions thanks Pat Anybody got any other questions? So uh, when the students have got their e-portfolio and they give the link to the employer, does it, I guess it shows the employer absolutely everything. So I was sort of thinking that where they have the section for their futures and they're putting in ideas of things that they might like to do, do they just need to tidy that up before they share it with the employer? Or is there a way that they could uh, sort of exclude the employer from being able to see that bit? Yeah, definitely. Well, there are, there are a couple of different ways they can do it. They can. It looks a little bit clunky if they just change the permissions on that section to not be able to see because you can see the sections there but you can't see the documents in it um but what you can do in google drive and i was playing with this um with one of my pgc students in my last job is they only needed probably about 80 percent of their e-portfolio and a lot of it they didn't want to be shown because you know it says things like i've always wanted to do this and the job that they were going for was not that <laughs> um so what they did is in their google drive they simply right clicked made a copy of the site so they had two and it duplicates it perfectly exactly everything made a copy and then just deleted those two sections so they had their original that's all almost acted as a master and they just 
right clicked, made a copy, and then just tailored it to every job that they went went for. And yeah, so it's, and I think what what surprised me so much about this is that this idea started incredibly conceptually a couple of years ago. It built up and built up, and the real learning has come from what the students have chosen to do with it, which has been astounding. Like you know, they said um, you know, and they and they say things so casually like. Just right click, make a copy, delete what you don't want and send that. And then they put their bag on their shoulder and then they leave. And you go, that's fantastic. That's a really good idea. Well done. Oh, fantastic. So um, I think the learning definitely comes the other way around. The students say, Jodie, why don't you just, why don't you do, just do this? And you go, well, hang on, let me just write it down. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, that's a really good idea. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you do, do you have um, specific sort of points through the course where you're saying to tutors could you sort of have something in your module where you're going to go back to the um, e-portfolio so I know you're saying sign up for the mentoring that would look great because you can put this on your portfolio but are there also touch points maybe within modules or or is it a sort of holistic process? Yeah um, I think this this COVID-19 sort of situation has made me reflect a lot on um, the changes in assessments and one of my um, one of my colleagues has decided that they want to change one of the assessments to looking at case studies and the students have to choose a case study that links closely to their placement and then reflect on that case study about children's behavior in one of their child psychology modules in year three so i then said to her brilliant now i want them to add that into their e-portfolio because it's a professional case study so it's i think it's about and i and i know i'm speaking from my experience as the as the course leader i, I can see everybody's changes in their course of it. so I can see where it can fit in but I think it's definitely about taking those grabbing hold of those opportunities and saying right this can fit into that um, and I know that we're very vocational so in terms of the um, mentoring um, one of our students is uh, one of our colleagues sorry is, is teaching um, social minds at the moment and a lot of the mentoring stuff crosses over with that so she's pulling a lot of stuff out of that saying right this links really well to this and students it's so easy for them. All they're doing is taking parts of their assessment and cutting and pasting them into their e-portfolios. So it's no extra work. It's just putting them in or embedding the document or something. But it is definitely about doing it. I think we might try the the sort of really routine dipping it, dipping in at this point of the year, dipping in at that point of the year and seeing if that works. Um, Linked to that was a question around, because um, we're doing something similar with a new employability module that we're starting at level four for our students, and we're going to have one of these portfolios, and, and some of you, your ideas and suggestions are, are fantastic. Um, but I'm also wondering how important are those touch points with the personal tutor? So it, is it also a question of that intrinsic motivation, but also having something tangible that prompts those conversations with personal tutors that somebody's interested in me and somebody's helping me to make sense of, of some of this and that that step two of getting the whole team involved is probably the most challenging thing you know where if if a, if a student comes in and they're having a tutor conversation and it is about something like a real pastoral issue getting the don't your e-portfolio is really difficult so um it is yes yeah, it's a challenge yeah i don't know really it is a real challenge i think getting all tutors to sing off the same hymn sheet is so important um it's a perennial it's, challenge across yeah. the people isn't it and it always will be is you know we've all got so many things going on and people are swamped especially at the moment to mention it and i can i can even see myself waving a student off and going oh do you know i didn't even i didn't even ask <laughs> so yeah it, 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 yeah a real challenge i'm sorry i haven't got really anything to mitigate it yeah a real challenge at this point it'll be ongoing i think Check it in, sorry. <laughs> so uh, I had the same problem. So in the employability lead for the department and for years I've had real trouble getting the tutors involved. But what we've done now is in the for the tutorial program, we've uh, flipped it around. So it's it's mainly based around employability. So every week that they meet, they have an employability activity that they do. So basically all of the things that I couldn't fit into the lectures, sort of like the smaller things that need maybe small group or one to one, I put into the tutorials. So it could be that you could embed that perhaps in the tutorials. Mm -hmm. Do you have is that in, as part of an employability module then or? It is now. It didn't used to be. The tutorials used to be sort of more um, traditional academic stuff, if you like. But I asked kindly, <laughs> please, could I have the tutorials as well? And they do still have some sort of more academic -y stuff, but uh, most of it is based around the employability. And and yeah, it's sort of part taken as part of the module now as well. OK, 
tutors yeah. engage better with that because I think they had a program I wrote out this is what you need to do step one step two step three and they've really sort of engaged with that now but don't ask them to check CVs because they don't like that <laughs> that's, that's Julie that's a really good one it's almost like having a crib sheet of for especially one-on-one -on -one tutorials just make sure you touch base about x y and z and that's the, the crib sheet's been really helpful for us it doesn't necessarily mean that all tutors have the time or the inclination to use it but it has helped almost like a tutorial checklist please look at these things so the e-portfolio could be embedded as part of that i think yeah and also this doesn't necessarily play to the natural strengths and interests of every academic so i think that's the real challenge isn't it that actually they're not necessarily not because they don't want to but they're not always confident actually to engage in these kind of conversations so i think the crib sheets help there as well yeah, and, and a little bit of an organic sort of um, outcome of it which I found quite funny is that students ended up because of the ownership element of it students ended up sort of doing a little bit of a my dad's bigger than your dad with their e-portfolios like I've I've put this in mine have you and then the question is hmm, well, an element of competitiveness I'm going to make sure that I do and so there, there is a lot a, a sort of a little bit of peer development that happens a bit a bit sort of a bit of organically so but that's quite good and then towards the end of the year we end up with some people that have really engaged and some people that have got the bare bones of what they needed to be assessed for and I think that's the nature that's going to be the nature of the game of it. We have something similar with our we do brand me presentations and um, we had something really similar so they're working on them in, in class individually but every time they stand up to present them three or four times in the year there's that little bit of competition with myself so I'm not I want to be better than John but I want to be better than I was last time round um, and then you do listen to John and you think oh I like what he did there and maybe I could do something and that is the magic I think if you can like you seem to have done that with your portfolios once you've harnessed whatever magic that is that's happening there that's when it really flies I think and, and going back to that intrinsic it's definitely better to be in competition with yourself I want it to look so much better than it did four months ago I want it to look better now it's so much better than oh they, there's this because they end up sort of um they end up sort of making it quite uh like a good practice pinch like a borrowing thing as opposed to because they're not they're not necessarily competing for jobs because the spectrum of jobs that they go into for our guys is so wide they're not all going for the same position so yeah they can work together quite nicely which is good i've got a bit of a, a uh don't know grumpy traditional left-wing academic question but honestly I, i'm here and i'm thank you very much for the um for the presentation and, and it's lots to think about basically from, from the context of this question is that i work i teach on a film production module but i'm the sort of resident theorist historian uh person so I, i've got no practical experience in the industry and i'm and i'm you know so some of the questions we're talking about sort of you know expertise is a, a problem when i'm asked to think about employability but the other thing i'm i struggle with is that actually you know I think the industry that we are teaching our students to get into needs radical reform and changing. And, you know, it's been in the media a lot. So, you know, particularly with one of one of the university's research themes is democratic citizenship. And one of the broader things we need to be doing is preparing our students to be, you know, self-critical, you know, compassionate, you know, human beings. Quite often the advice we need to give them for them to get their first runner job, I think, can conflict with that responsibility and that you're basically trying to teach them values that I'm, you know, not comfortable teaching them. So I don't know, this is, I guess, just a broader starter question and a discussion, but I'd be interested in, Jodie, if you've had any problems with either staff members or had to wrestle with, you know, the desire to make students self-critical and, and, and sort of, you know, thinking human beings versus the desire to do things because your employers will want you to do them, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I can see from your perspective as well the the, the battle that you're having is really mm. is really interesting to communicate to students because of their standpoint as well. I think yeah. for us we can mitigate a lot of these things simply by um, the reflective nature of it and allowing mm. them to reflect in whatever they way that they feel. I mean, sometimes and it's it's almost something that we've got to mitigate. Students will reflect on a situation that's happened in their professional workplace by saying that they felt like the professionals in that workplace were completely negligent and they didn't they didn't like this they didn't like that um and although we need to get them to write very objectively and very understand you know about that place it's it's allowing that almost freedom of reflection for them to do that because mm -hmm. i can see if you were to get if you were to get some incredibly standardized robot e-portfolios enhancing the view of an industry that you don't necessarily feel you know it needs radical reform 
it will probably professionally destroy you a little bit to be reading them all like oh my goodness so i think having that real you know, I get to position where i'm reading what i would say is an effective cv to get in a job but um but but a potentially um awful human being produced in result you know um you know to be dramatic about it uh. Yeah, and I think I think being able to embed those conversations, especially if students can embed things like blogs and videos, if they could almost show their ePortfolio as having a balanced discussion about these ideas to acknowledge them, that might be that might have a lot more reflective power than simply enhancing professionalism for the for the sake of skills we need to tick off for these jobs. Mm. You know, and, and that it links to the undergraduate competencies as well, I think. Sure. Just jump in there as well. I think that's a really um a valid point. I think one of the things we always struggled with is a when we ask students to start writing artifacts and reflecting on their experiences, they're really bad at reflection. It, it's something that doesn't come naturally. They find it really hard, um, and we we got there eventually. I think one of the things we always did was try to understand because my my desk my background is kind of like tourism management, destination management. So the jobs for students were always applying for. You know, we made them apply for a destination management job. You know, they had to come up and do a CV in an interview for I think it was tourism director on St Helena was the last one I think we did before we left. But they also then had to do a professional practice piece. And what we were encouraging them to do was track their experiences around um, job specifications, so they understood the nature of the jobs that were there, and so could learn to write what they were doing against the expectation of an employee in terms of what kind of what they'd be expecting at that at that point but it's horses for courses and again you know an e-portfolio for one thing an assessment is a little bit different to perhaps a reflective piece so it's just reflecting i think sometimes the learning outcome of this type of activity and what you want it to do but also contributing this wider agenda around getting students to be slightly more critical of their own career pathways and what it is they actually need to be doing and i think visual approaches where they're constantly doing it and, I, and i'll tell you something Judy, the other thing you've been today is I think this is a fantastic vehicle for fellowship plans. Because at the moment, with my Apex hat on, I'm asking everybody to write 3,000 words. And it's like, when we're encouraging students to be creative, I think I'd like to do something like this and say to staff, right, you can write 3,000 words or you can do a portfolio. And hand that in instead. So I think it's got a lot of transferability. Thanks. Brilliant. OK. Um, I know, Andy, you're going to have to you're going to have to shoot off soon, aren't you? Is there anything else just before we bring off? Thanks, everyone, for coming. Have another one. Have you. <laughs> have you got a go, Julie? No worries. No, I've got another question. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, you did it. That's <laughs> good. You were going. Hi, everyone. Yeah, lovely. No, it's okay. <laughs> um, I just wondered, I just wondered how you got the freshers to engage with it. If they weren't actually doing it for their assessment, how did you sort of pique their interest around doing it? To be fair, with the first years, <laughs> with the first years, I think especially with this specific situation, we've had a lot of anxiety surrounding it. Um, so it is, it's kind of been left with them. You have to, I'll have to answer that question next year. But with the ones that are really interested, it's almost like I've been telling them what you know, what's been really interesting this year. Put it into a Google site because they, they they are familiar with Google sites from a couple of different sort of elements. So put it into a Google site and call it your ePortfolio. So that when they start in year two, they'll have a couple of notes that they'll look back and go, OK, I don't know why this is in here. But then hopefully then it can be put into some sort of context. What I find with year one is that um, any mark that they get that's higher than the other mark, no, it doesn't really matter what it is, they put it in. <laughs> so anything that they got at 40, forget. But anything that's sort of maybe a two third. Even if it's a 500 word article review, it's in there. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's really relevant, but they put it in. So, um, yeah, I, I have to stay tuned on that with really with you. <laughs> That's OK, <laughs> thank you. No worries. Is there any other questions? OK, lovely. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Go and put the kettle on.